How many of you have read the entire book of Ecclesiastes? Let me see your hand. Now God is watching, huh? You've read the entire book of Ecclesiastes. Well, I'm surprised that so many raise your hands. But let me ask another question. How many of you understand the entire book of Ecclesiastes? Let me see your hands. Not one person raised their hands. So I know that this morning the Lord is going to be talking to us you know, along the lines of bringing understanding to his word, which we have read, some of us, but do not understand. And I still want to compliment you for reading even though you don't understand. It is important that we always get into the word of God because somewhere along the line, even if it is one line, God will speak to us. Having said that, how many of you have read the book of Ecclesiastes? You don't understand the entire book, but there were some things that God spoke to you from it. Let me see your hands. There we go. So keep on reading and just pray to God for understanding. Okay, well, the book of Ecclesiastes, while being a very informative book, and it is very, very informative, for it contains many golden nuggets, but at the same time, it can be misunderstood if not taken in its entirety. It has to be taken in its entirety from beginning right on to the end. If you stop halfway, it makes no sense to you. The author is King Solomon, David's successor to the throne of Israel by decree of God himself, and he was the wisest king over all Israel. He was not wise in his own conceits, as many, so many in the world today, contrary to the word of God. His wisdom was supernaturally imparted to him by God when in 2 Chronicles 1 and 7, should be on the board, God appeared to him and said to him, ask, what shall I give to you? Now, this was not in a dream. He was in the tabernacle of God. He was worshiping God. They just had a very worshipful service, praising God. And God appeared to him. The Bible doesn't say in what form or in what way. It just says God appeared to him and asked him the question, what shall I give to you? How many of us here this morning would love to have such an experience? That the very God, the creator of the heaven and the earth, who can do all things, appear to you and ask you what you want. How many of us would like that this morning? Tell me what you want and I will give it to you. This is what God meant when he says, ask, what shall I give to you? It would be interesting to hear some of our answers this morning, wouldn't it? Some will want cars, some will want house, some will want husband, some will want wife, children. We will all want all kinds of things, but not so with Solomon. In verse 10, Solomon said, Give me now wisdom and knowledge that I may go out and come before this people, for who can judge this your people that is so great. Give me now wisdom and knowledge. Verse 11. And God said to Solomon, because this was in your heart, and you have not asked riches, wealth, nor honor, nor the life of your enemies, neither have you asked long life, but have asked for wisdom and knowledge for yourself, that you may judge my people over whom I have made you king, 
Wisdom, verse 12, and knowledge is granted unto you, and I will give you riches and wealth and honor such as none of the kings have had before you and none shall have after you. What do you want, Solomon? Give me wisdom that I may go before, I may lead your people. He could have asked anything, but he wanted to do what was God's will for his life. So what can be clearly seen here in this discourse between Solomon and God is the principle established by Jesus in Matthew 6, 33, when Jesus said, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. This is exactly what Solomon did. Not knowing what Jesus would be saying in hundreds of years to come. Solomon only wanted wisdom to do what was best for God's people and God honored him giving him the wisdom such as no other king, in addition to what he didn't ask for, the riches, wealth, and honor that he did not ask for. So there's a vital lesson that can be learned here, and we are admonished by it in James 4 and 3, which tells us, you ask and receive not. Because you ask amiss that you may consume it upon the lusts of your flesh, your selfish desires. And I want to believe this morning that this is the reason why so many of God's people do not get the answer to their requests from God for this very reason. Because we go to God with selfish Desires, not thinking about others, just thinking about ourselves. How many a child of God is praying for their son, praying for their daughter, praying for their father, praying for their mother to be saved? But you don't hear them praying for anybody else to be saved. But that does not line up with what God's word says, seek ye first the kingdom of God. God is interested in all people to be saved. But if we are only concerned about us four and no more, then that is what James meant that you are asking amiss because you want to consume it upon the lust, your own lust. No. If we are interested in our son, our daughter, our mother, father, whoever it is wanting to be saved, then we must be interested in what God's will is for people to be saved. That none shall perish and all will come to everlasting life. So all of us who are praying for somebody to be saved, but we can't find ourselves in a prayer meeting where we pray for people to be saved, well then wait, hold on. You're doing yourself and the other person and injustice. I just thought I would throw that in. That was not the case with Solomon at that time. His regard was first for the people of God and what was God's will for his people. It was with the God-given wisdom that he wrote the majority of the Proverbs of the Bible. Not all, the majority. And while the book of Proverbs is written during his middle years, the book of Ecclesiastes was written during his last years. Now it's important that we understand that because all that he had spoken of in the book of Ecclesiastes was as a result of his experience through the years. What he learned, what he didn't learn, the mistakes he made, the foolishness he did, all that is incorporated in the book of Ecclesiastes. 
So as a result of writing that book in the latter years of his life, he was able to reflect on his whole life as king over Israel and the time when he failed to apply self-same wisdom given to him by God to his own life, resulting in the accumulative effect of a spiritual decline, idolatry, and a life of self-indulgence. This is what is all contained in the book of Ecclesiastes. He had experienced wealth. He was the richest king because God gave him that wealth. He had experience with power, with honor, fame, and sensual pleasure, all in an abundance. A man like he had it, and he did it all. He had 700 wives. That doesn't sound like wisdom to me. <laughs> 700 wives and 300 concubines. So it is evident that Solomon did not continue to apply his God-given wisdom. Wisdom is like the word of God. You can get it, but if you don't apply it, it does you no good. First Kings chapter 11 verse 1 tells us, but Solomon loved many strange women. People that God said his people must have nothing to do with. He went and he married these people in contravention to God's command. He had wives and concubines from among the heathen nations, contrary to the command of God. And all this left him, in the end, completely disillusioned with pleasure and materialism as a way of happiness. Please listen to me this morning. All of which he had left him in the end completely disillusioned with pleasure and materialism as a way to happiness. He was seeking happiness in things like so many in the world today, not to mention even those in Christ Jesus. We're still seeking after happiness in materialism, in things of the world, and leaving Jesus in the second or third place. So Ecclesiastes records his cynical reflections of the futility and emptiness in seeking happiness apart from God and his word. We're talking about the book of Ecclesiastes. I want to say that again. Ecclesiastes records, you wouldn't find it written like that, but this is the story of Solomon's life in Ecclesiastes. It records his cynical reflections of the futility and emptiness in seeking happiness apart from God and his word. Let me say to us this morning as a church, there is futility and emptiness in seeking happiness apart from God and his word. If you are in that place this morning when you are seeking 
after things more than seeking after God, it's not going to satisfy you. It's not going to satisfy you. Nothing can satisfy you like a right relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't care what you have. I don't care what you possess. I don't care if you like Solomon and you have plenty wives and husbands. No, nothing satisfies you like a right relationship with God. People will disappoint you. People will frustrate you. People could cause you discouraged. But in it all, as long as you have got that relationship with God, in spite of everything, you can smile and be happy and know that you are okay with God. Only God can give you the peace in a storm. Only Jesus Christ can cause the waves to be still. Only Jesus. So Solomon, realizing that experientially that there is futility and emptiness in seeking happiness, he begins in Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 2, with the statement, Vanity of vanities, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. This is a man who had it all. This is a man who God gave wisdom more than any other king. This is a man who had all the riches, the wealth, the power, the influence that one could possibly have. This is a man who did it all, including having how many wives? 700 wives and 300 concubines. He concludes, vanity of vanities, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. And that is what everything we possess and everything that we do in this life, everything that we obtained, everything that we ventured into and succeeded, whether it be education, whatever it is, if we pursue the world and God the world and we don't have that relationship with Christ, everything is vanity, vanity of vanities. So it is evident that Solomon in his latter years had great regrets of how he lived his life. And I want to believe that the reason God inspired this book was to warn us. It was to warn us as his people not to make the same mistakes. God didn't just write the book inspired the writing of the book just to show Solomon's lack of wisdom when he had been given wisdom, you know. No, it was about us. The Bible tells us in Romans, all these things were written aforetime for our learning, that through them we might have hope and comfort in the scriptures. So these things, whether we believe it or not, they are inspired by God for our learning. It is for us to learn from them, all those who made mistakes, not to make the same mistakes as they did. So there is no mistake in it. It is futile to base one's values in life on earthly possessions and personal ambition. 
But regretfully, regretfully, this is to a great extent happening not only in the world, but in the body of Christ. It's happening in the body of Christ. You see this to a great extent among some of those who are known to be tele-evangelists. I don't know if you read about the things that people of God standing behind God's desk, the ministers, people, the things that they say and they do. But they seem never to be satisfied with what they have. Always wanting more and more and more. You hear of them having airplanes, but wanting bigger ones and better ones. These are people who are supposed to be preaching the word of God. Seducing God's people to give and give beyond that which is scriptural just so they can satisfy their own material lust. It is evident that they didn't read the book of Ecclesiastes and see Solomon's folly. You hear, you hear of it quite a lot in the prosperity gospel, which is not a gospel. We call it a prosperity gospel, but it's not the gospel. The gospel is truth. The gospel is about love. That's the gospel. But we have the prosperity gospel where the preachers are just directing people, not to Christ, but how to get prosperous. I am not saying for one moment that it is future to have earthly possessions, you know. No, I'm not saying that. Jesus' principle of seeking first the kingdom of God promises that the other things will be added. So nothing is wrong. Nothing is wrong in having earthly possessions. What I did say was that it is futile to base one's values in life on earth. Let me read that again. It is futile to base one's values in life on earthly possessions and personal ambition. I want to repeat it again. It is futile to base one's values in life on earthly possessions and personal ambition. Jesus said that in Matthew 6, 21 in a different way. He says, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. So if you are basing your values on earthly possessions, that's where your heart is going to be. And since we cannot serve two masters at the same time, because Jesus said it, you're going to either love the one and hate the other, or you're going to hate the one and love the other, then we have got to understand that we have got to serve this one master. And his name is Jesus. And he promises that when you do that first, he will take care of the rest. But what's happening today is people are chasing after the rest and not doing the first things first. Jesus gave a parable. No, he said also in Luke 12, 15, a man's life does not consist of the abundance of things which he possesses. And he gave a parable in verse 16 about a rich man who could not be satisfied with what he had, but wanted more and more. I remember many, many years ago, it was my first trip, I think I was just about 22, my first trip to the United States of America, I was walking in Washington, D.C., no, in New York, 
And um, I saw this massive building and this um, thing set up at the bottom of the building and, and an inscription mark. Um, who was that rich man in America at that time? Um, Rockefeller. Rockefeller Foundation. And I heard the story of someone asking Rockefeller personally, how much is enough? Because he was the wealthiest man in America at the then time. How much is enough? You know what was his answer? Just a little more. <laughs> Just a little. You know what that means? You can never be satisfied. No matter what you get, you just want a little more. So Jesus is giving this parable about this man who wanted a little more. So he broke down his bonds and he built greater ones, saying to himself, verse 19, Should soul, you have much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said unto him, You fool, this night thy soul shall be required of you, then whose shall, whose shall those things be which you have provided? Verse 21, So is he that layeth up treasure for himself, and is not rich towards God. There is absolutely nothing wrong in possessing things. Absolutely nothing wrong. The danger is when things possess us. Can I say that to you again? There is absolutely nothing in possessing things. The danger is in when things possess us. And this is what was happening to Solomon. This is what brought Solomon's pitfall. And towards the latter end, the latter disappointing years of his intensely self-centered life of affluence, pleasure, and worldly success, Solomon realized that the pursuit of happiness through these means had ended for him in dissatisfaction and emptiness causing him to conclude that all was vanity and vexation of spirit. So what the book is about. Can't go into all the details of all the verses and the things he had. He had said quite a lot, of, he dropped a lot of golden nuggets. I, you know, our sister Jenny picked out one some time ago about the flies in the apothecary, remember that? That's right there in the book of Ecclesiastes. Cast your bread upon the water, so in nuggets, you know. But the book itself is about his folly. When God had given him wisdom to attain everything and to be in right standing with him, what happened? In the end, God had to take the kingdom away from him, leaving him with just one, Judah and So this was Solomon's pitfall. Realizing this towards the latter days of his life and now applying the God-given wisdom, he writes, he writes to young people and to ourselves as adults, in chapter 11, verse 9, he says, Rejoice, O young man, or woman, or person. Rejoice in your youth, 
and let your heart cheer you in the days of your youth and walk in the ways your heart and the sight of your eyes. Do all those things. Rejoice. Enjoy yourself. But know you that for all these things, God will bring you into judgment. In effect, God wants his people to rejoice. God wants his people to enjoy life. Enjoy yourselves. Young people, as well as age people, enjoy life. But all such rejoicing and enjoyment must be tempered with the recognition that God holds us accountable for our actions. God will hold us accountable for our actions. The way we behave, the things we say, the things we do that we should not do. He is going to hold us accountable. This is what Ecclesiastes inspired by God will tell us coming to the end. Verse 1 of chapter 12. He says, Remember now your creator in the days of your youth. You see the wisdom is now kicking back in. After all the folly, the wisdom is now kicking back in to warn us, to warn us. Remember now your creator in the days of your youth. While the evil days come not, nor the years draw nigh when you shall say, I have no pleasure in them, meaning in the old age that coming along and the problems that come with it. Verse 2, when the sun or the light or the moon be not darkened and the clouds return after the rain. He is using the elements as an allegory of the springtime and the prime time of our youth. Before the infirmities of old age step in. How many of you know that that is in, inevitable? Except that you die when you're young. And take it from one with experience. I've just crossed 74. It's not the same again. Things happen inside of these bodies that does not happen when you are young. Age brings infirmities. Major one is arthritis. <laughs> it begins to set into your joints. It's not a happy time to wake up in the morning. Praise God, I could still do it and jump up and run around. But it's not a happy time. I've heard people talk about this thing, arthritis, and it could be a deadly thing at times, depending on the degree. So he's saying, remember, this is the time when you're young, remember, and I wanted to talk to the young people this morning. I asked for them to be here, but then I heard there was graduation. So I says, no, leave them. We don't want to disappoint them with their graduation. But there are some of us here this morning, as a matter of fact, all of us are young. I don't care what your age is, you're young. Remember now the creator of your creator in the days of your youth. 
please don't put God second place in your life. So he is using the elements as an allegory of the springtime in your life, the prime and prosperity time of life, but saying at the same time, recognize the fact that old age will step in. And then he goes on in allegory fashion from verses 3 to 7. Let's, let, let's look at it or it should come up on the board. In verses 3 to 7. Remember we are getting an understanding of Ecclesiastes. Eh? He says, in the days when the keepers of the house shall tremble. He's talking about when you when you start to walk and shake and the strong men shall bow themselves and the grinders your teeth because they are few and those that look out the windows be darkened you're talking about the darkening of your eyes he's talking about the aging process and the doors shall be shut in the streets when the sound of the grinding is low, when you can't swallow too much or hear. And you shall rise up and the voice, at the voice of the bird, meaning that you ain't sleeping long again. You're getting up very, very early in the morning. You're going to bed late, late in the night. Short sleep, long days, short nights. And the daughters of music shall be brought low when you can't hear your music again you're starting to lose your also when they shall f be afraid of that which is high you're afraid of heights now thank god i could still come up here <laughs> and fears shall be in the way and the almond tree shall flourish and the grasshopper shall be a burden and desire shall fail because because what man goes his long goes to his long home and the mourners go about the streets you know what happening there or even the silver cord be loosed or the golden bowl be broken or the pitcher be broken and the fountain of the wheel broken in its cisterns you're dead. You're dead. Then shall the dust return to the earth as it was, and the spirit shall return unto God who gave it. Vanity of vanities, says the preacher, all is vanity. So you see, in the end, in the end, what shall it profit a man if he should gain the whole world and lose his own soul? So that when we come into the house of God and the preacher is preaching from the word of God and God is telling us how we should live and how we should not live, but we go about our life doing just the opposite because we are hearers of the word only. We are not doers of the word. And we are thinking we are okay because we have not murdered anyone. We have not stolen anything, hopefully. We have not committed fornication. We have not committed adultery because we have these major sins in our minds that those are the things that God is displeased with. But I want us to know this morning, according to the word of God, that all unrighteousness is sin. The things we say, the things we do, even our thoughts, we sin against God. He's a thrice holy, holy, holy God. So much so that he gave his only begotten son to die on a cross, take our sins upon him. 
just so that he can bring us into his kingdom as people who have never sinned. Justify us in his eyes by the blood of his son, Jesus Christ. He's a holy, holy, holy God. And the Bible tells us that we sin in thought, in word, and in deed. Thank God for Jesus this morning. Thank God for Jesus this morning. But, but, there's a big, big but. It doesn't end there. Solomon gave a conclusion to the whole thing, to the whole book. He gave this conclusion. Let us, verse 13 of chapter 12, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. You read from chapter 1, you read at the end, well, this is the, what the whole book is about. If you don't understand verse 13, you can't understand the book. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. What is the conclusion? Fear God and keep his commandments. What are his commandments today? Is it those that were given on the Mount Horeb, the Ten Commandments that he gave Moses? No, those are moral commandments. But Jesus Christ came to give a new commandment. We heard about it last week, that you love one another as I have loved you. But the fact of the matter is, the entire New Testament is the now command of God not denying or taking away what went before. I'm not talking about the, 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 um, the Levitical ceremonial laws now, but Christians are still supposed to observe the moral laws of God. All of them. We heard a lot about it last week. We come to church. We hear the word of God. But are we living? Are we living the word of God? Are husbands loving their wives as Christ loved the church? We had it last week. Children obeying their parents as their wives are submitted to. The whole New Testament is God's command to us in Christ Jesus. And it's not like Islam. It's not like Islam. You see, in Islam, there's a scale that Allah has that if you do so much bad. You could do so much good. And as long as the good balances with the bad, you're okay. That's Islam. But God says, if you sin in one, you're guilty of all. They have no balance in there. I said, thank God for Jesus this morning. Thank God for his mercy. Thank God for his grace. Thank God that we can read in his word that the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us 
from all sin. That means when we have a wrong thought about something or somebody or we cussing somebody in our mind, the blood of Jesus Christ is taking care of that. It's a continual cleansing. This doesn't mean that you have got to continue doing it because if you continue doing it, there's going to be a hardening of your heart. We heard about that some time ago. The hardening of the sin is a deceitful thing. It hardens your heart. Don't continue in doing the things that are wrong. When we come here, it's not just to hear. It is to hear and do. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter, Ecclesiastes. Fear God and keep his commands, for this is the whole duty of man. And what does the last verse say? For God shall bring every work. God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, with every secret thing that you and I don't know about that be doing. Not, you, you will know what you're doing, but I wouldn't know and the others wouldn't know. But God knows all things. He searches the hearts. This is why God's word tells us, and we heard a message about it sometime from Brother Glenroy, Guard your heart with all diligence. Jesus says, give no place for the devil. Listen, we take this thing, we don't take this seriously. But Solomon in his now applied wisdom is saying, for God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing. You think God is not hearing, we think God is not seeing, we think God is not knowing. Well, he knows all things, even our most secret thoughts whether it be good or whether it be bad. The conclusion of the whole matter. But you say, but pastor, that is the Old Testament. We are saved. We don't have to be judged. Well, let us go down to the New Testament. And we will see in 2 Corinthians, chapter 5, verse 10, Paul the Apostle writing to the Corinthian church after the resurrection of Jesus, writing to the Christians, says, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that which he had done, whether it be good or bad. We are not going to be judged on, our, on sin that we had committed before we were saved. That's taken care of by the blood of Jesus Christ. But as we continue on in Christ, the things that we do, God is going to hold us responsible. And it has nothing to do with our salvation. That is settled, sealed, signed, and delivered. You're sealed by the Holy Spirit of God. But the Bible talks about getting um, 
Rewards. Thank you. Rewards. 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 Don't be ashamed. Don't want to be ashamed. Don't ever want to be ashamed in the presence of God when you see the person that you hate and you're telling people all kinds of things about with a crown to cast at Jesus' feet and you ain't got nothing. You'd be ashamed. There would be rewards. God is a just God. And the Bible tells us in the book of Hebrews, he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. There will be rewards. Paul said it. I've run the race. I've fought a good fight. I have finished my course. Now, there is laid up for me in heaven a crown of righteousness. Not only for me, but for all who will run the race, fight the fight, and finish the course, and be like Paul. There would be rewards. So, in closing, let me say that I sincerely believe that the Lord inspired Solomon to write the book of Ecclesiastes so as to share his regrets and first-hand testimony with others, especially with young people who are so easily influenced by a materialistic world so that they and we, the adults, will not make the same mistakes that Solomon made. I said it to you before, and I'll say it again. There is futility and emptiness in seeking happiness apart from God and from his word. God bless you richly. You understand.
Yeah.